Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the ball. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome along. I hope everyone enjoyed the first weekend of the Football League. So many talking points for myself and Rory to get through with Eamon Fitzmaurice and Enda McGinley. Let's start in Division 1, lads. Mayo, eight-point win against Galway. Big win in Tralee for Derry against Kerry. Great win, too, for Tyrone against Roscommon after playing most of the second half with 14 men. No doubt about it, though. Game of the weekend in Croke Park as Monaghan toppled the dubs in uh, Croker on Saturday night. And Eamon, really, even when we're just chatting off air before starting recording, and that felt like the game of the weekend. What a way to start this league. It was brilliant, wasn't it? It was. It was a fantastic game and a massive result for Monaghan as well, Jackie, you know, to uh, go to Crow Park. I know that they have a great record against Dublin um, over in, in the recent past in the league, but the fact that there's a lot of change in their group, that there's been, you know, there's been retirements, there's been Rory Beggins, obviously, gone to America at the moment, Carl Gallers in Australia. Darren Hughes, Conor McManus aren't back playing yet. So it, it was up to a lot of the lads that have a bit of experience, the likes of Brannigan and Steve O'Hanlon to step up and drive it. And Killian Lavelle at fullback as well, I thought was brilliant because, you know, adapting as an inter-county midfielder to go back fullback and then to be marking no, 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 no one better than Conor O'Callaghan, it was a fair test for, for Killian Lavelle and he, and he handled it well. And... Monaghan traditionally have always been good at that, as relocating players, getting the best out of their players. You know, even Conor McCarthy going to wing back. I didn't mention him either. He was missing the last night. So it was a great game of football. It was a fantastic win for Monaghan. The dubs looked like at the end when that ball went out over the sideline that they would do what they've done a hundred times in the past and come up and get a shot off and get a draw. And the whole country, bar the dub supporters, would have been groaning. How did Monaghan not hang on? But... Uh, uh, the very un-Brian Fenton-like moment meant that that Monaghan could uh, get a bit of the security blanket with the last point. But yeah, it was a great game of football. Very enjoyable. I, do you know, I was listening to Conor McManus during the weekend and he was on the BBC social podcast talking about just even that game against Dublin last year that they fully believed that they could go and win the game. And it was really refreshing to hear him talking like that because, you know, look, this is a Monaghan team that have been written off so many times that yet look what they do. For that team to go and deliver a performance like that on Saturday with the likes of without him, as, as Eamon says, like that was a big statement by this team. It was massive. And again, <laughs> the one thing that wanes Monaghan folk up more than anyone else is the condescension that usually yeah. comes yeah. out. And why are we so surprised that they went big Dublin when that's what they've been doing pretty much boringly so in the league for multiple years now? Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet you just can't help but admire them. And yet that admiration feels condescending. So I, I'm thoroughly confused how to feel about Monaghan, but I <laughs> love watching them. Yeah. Uh, what they've done. And I, I loved how deadpan Vinny Corey was afterwards and how deadpan the players were. It was if, yeah, that's pretty boring. We don't want to... Uh, insult Dublin by in any way celebrating at all so it was thoroughly impressive they pace so a lot of the players that they were missing are their older brigade the pace that they played that game with and I think it was sort of a theme across the weekend that pace is really the where, where the game is at at the minute uh, but in that half hour lane particularly Hamill, Bannigan uh, and of course Stephen O'Hanlon the pace they played with was electric. They've obviously Conor McCarthy coming in. So you, you can see the direction of travel that Monaghan is playing. It was a phenomenal brand of football they, they played with. It suited them to a tee because it matched up, as Eamon was suggesting there, defensively, they were as solid as any. And defensively is where Monaghan, you just know as a player going out against Monaghan, it is going to be tough to break them down. But the fact that they're able to marry that now with that brilliant pace going forward and then that bit of class with Jack and Karen up front, it's, it's a nice... You, you can see the direction of travel that that team's going, uh, and it's it's pretty impressive. Mm. No panic from the dubs either, though, Rory, to be fair. Like, you know, I think they still played a lovely brand of football. There's no panic there yet either. No panic. I think they have a couple of issues. Uh, but look, it's very early on in the league. It's January, and I do think there that needs to be put in there as a caveat for anything on the first weekend of the league coming back. The only thing I suppose that might be of a slight concern is they named a fairly strong team. I mean, they weren't missing a huge amount. Obviously, um, James McCarthy came on. Cluxton, look, sure, 
who knows if he's going to play this year. He'll probably find out in April sometime and there's plenty of time. Mick Fitzsimons, I think, was a big loss at full back. Mm. That was an issue. Sean McMahon is not a full back and I think, you know, that was shown on Saturday night. Conceded three goals, could have conceded six. I mean, you know, they're... Ohana made one very good save and a couple of other times it was very much, you know, last ditch efforts to try and uh, curl a couple of other Monaghan attacks. So I think they have one or two issues to start to figure out. They probably will look to fast track Theo Clancy into that full back line now. He's very young still. Only like, 20. You know, very, very young to be going into such a demanding position in a physical sense. But look, he's coming out of Kilmacud Crokes. Normally they are usually up to speed very, very quickly when it comes to the SC side of things. Um, I think he might have had a bit of a rugby career as well at underage level, which will obviously help. So he, I could see him being fast-tracked in. I was interested to see how Greg McEnany was going to get on. Didn't really show as much as I know that people around my neck of the woods out here would have herald him to us to a large extent he's a fingal man he's scary as harps there's a lot of talk about him now again look i think ultimately they won't panic but i think all the credit to monaghan i mean they just played they play such a, a, in the spot on the condescension really comes from admiration and i think sometimes we actually do tend to forget they've got brilliant footballers yeah they're really really good footballers like and so natural on the ball I mean, that goal that O'Hanlon scored in, in the first half. I mean, will we see a better goal all year? Well, if we do, it'll be good. It'll be a treat because yeah. there was, look, there, so many performances all over the field from that. I, I feel we could get tracked into staying in Croke Park for the day because it was just such a good game. But I'm conscious Croke of Park, trying to actually, get Jackie, through. Yeah. Jackie, just mm -hmm. on that and I'd be interested. Mm -hmm. Do you think Croke Park, well, we know it does, but it does seem, seem to lend itself to better quality games too. I think that is a factor, particularly at this time of the year. Would that be fair? I don't know. Uh, yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah, absolutely, Rory. And like, you know, we mentioned him already. I just, I was delighted to see Stephen O'Hanlon playing so well because yeah. he's a player I've kind of enjoyed watching over the last couple of years. He got a great goal, you know, a similar type goal where he cut in against Tyrone above him. Healy Park last year in the championship but he, he's kind of that was the most consistent performance I've seen from him throughout a game it's been flashes before this and you know we've seen the glimpses of the, the basketball coming out in, in the past and that kind of thing but <clears throat> I think we really saw on Saturday, Saturday night what he's capable of and the challenge for him now is producing that on a consistent basis because if he's playing at that level consistently it's, it's a massive um asset for, for Vinnie Corey going forward but um, Crow Park suits the likes of him and uh, you know when the conditions are like that definitely last Saturday evening. Yeah for sure well look that was one Ulster team doing the business at the weekend another Derry big performance for them to go to Tralee and get the result Eamon, I know you were in Tralee, obviously, and you were watching Derry with that performance against Kerry. I'm sure Kerry, like the Dubs, won't be panicking, but give me a sense of, of what a win like that on the road will do for this Derry team. Yeah, it was a fantastic start, and I think, you know, it's a great win for the team, but I also think it's a great win for, for Mickey Hart and, and Gavin Devlin just to get up and running, get the squad believing in what they're doing, get the Derry public behind them above there as well, you know, coming off to win in the, McGra or the McKenna Cup, the previous weekend and as well then they've they've Tyrone coming to town next weekend which is obviously going to be a huge game considering the way both teams played this weekend and of course the the Mickey Hart factor but it was it was a great win and they were fully they were full value for the win even though Kerry will be disappointed that with a couple of goal chances in the second half that even if they'd taken um, one of the ones that they had missed, they might have got at least a draw out of it, and it could have been, a, you know, a very different conversation then. But um, no, Derry will be absolutely delighted with that win, and it's um, it's not too many times uh, that you get wins down in Kerry, in particular in Tralee. It's been a, a great venue for for Kerry in the recent past, um, but uh, no, full, fully fully deserving of it. They were the better team for three quarters of the game. Kerry came really hard for the last 20 minutes, but um, Derry had to go and win the game again at the end, to be fair to them, and they did it. And Cormac Murphy winning that free for a young lad, you'd give him massive credit for that as well. Mm. Was, Mickey Wiley as classic. ever, Enda. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it was classic Derry. Like, 
Kerry were completely all over them. Like that last 10, 15 minutes, Derry were a major baller trying to get the the kick outs away. Kerry absolutely uh, done horribly on two, three really good goal chances. Like it was it Stephen O'Brien had that chance and he fisted it across for a, when really he should have, he'll regret not taking on the shot himself. But whenever Warren Lynch finally got that final kick out away, I was sitting watching it with, with my wife and I says, wait, do you see Derry's, Derry's scoring here? And as a thrown man, I couldn't want for anything more than Derry, obviously, to score. But you just, Derry have that inevitability, that safety in possession, that whenever they get set up and get the ball in their hands, they are so good at converting that to a scoring chance at the other end. And sure enough, uh, it, the, the sub took it on, made the run, cut across, won the free, but that ability to manage that situation, and you were asking about Mickey Hart, but that that's why Derry need to challenge themselves to go down to Kerry and to win that game. That's more important for Derry in terms of them stepping up to Division 1. Now, everybody has sort of looked at them very much as a Division 1 side, same as Dublin. It's sort of the two promoted teams this year aren't really being seen as promoted teams. They're seen as bona fide Division 1 teams. Uh, but Mickey will have went into Derry very much... The expectations in Derry is for an Ireland title. So that's that's easy win there for Mickey. He'll go in, okay, you just want to win the Ireland title? Okay, well then we have to win every game and we have to be able to beat any opponent that we come across, whatever conditions, whatever, if we're missing a few with injuries, if we're trying new players, whenever that game goes into the melting pot, well, you have to find a, a way to win it. You have to have that character about you to ride out the rough patches and find a way to win it. And so the Division One League campaign is a perfect place to do that. Uh, and they've done it by the skin of their teeth and with a very, very strong team against a weak and carry team. So all of those caveats are there, but it doesn't matter. Those There'll be always caveats in any game. Come championship, there'll always be wee things thrown into the mix. You have to get yourself somehow across the, the finish line at the end with your nose in front, and there you've done that. One of the caveats, Rory, I would have thought, is the depth of that squad. You know, you saw the Glen lads all playing at the weekend. If they are going to win a league and continue this form into the championship, it's going to be a big ask of a lot of those players who've been on the road for a long time. Particularly the club players. I mean, Glen lads have been on the go for two All-Ireland clubs mm. on the trot, won, won one last one. So that's definitely going to take its toll, depending on... Like, the other thing that you're going to probably see happen the course of this league is the attritional nature of division one football might also catch up with them to a certain extent like with all due respect and we definitely saw a big gap between the standards in the two divisions certainly in terms of conditioning when that might play like if for instance if somebody like a Connor Glass or a Shane McGuigan gets knocked out by a hamstring injury sometime you know on the eve of the Ulster Championship that's a death knell that's an absolutely killer blow so managing workload and payload and and understanding the sports science, which I'm sure and they will be would probably be able to tell us Mickey would be very attuned into and understanding. And I think it's a big part probably of modern intercounty management now and trusting your your medical people because I'd say your medical people and your and your doctors and your physios, they're nearly as important now as your selectors and your coaches. Well, especially because, with the shortened season. Exactly. And like a, a one one hamstring injury that might knock you out for five or six weeks could basically tear because by the time you get match fit again is a big thing. So going hammer and tongs this early on does carry a risk when you are working off a smaller smaller panel than what some of the other more established division one counties would have had you saw with kevin mcstay he's building a ferocious panel altogether like the depth that they have now so i think there is a risk with this but mickey's a gambler i mean he did he he and he, he, <laughs> usually his gambles pay off so you know mm, who are we yeah. to it sort of reminds me they are almost trying to create this almost unstoppable wave of momentum. I remember whenever Donegal, Donegal lost narrowly the year before they went on and won it. And I mind the year that they won it was 2012. They, there was just this sense that they were an unstoppable force coming through and that this wave of momentum with them. I think Derrier viewed last year, they came really up and people were tipping, okay, maybe they are a Ireland credit. And there was a lot of talk, are they, are they not? They're only, they're still in division two. They're only coming up from division four or three and now they're in two. Are we seriously saying they're a Ireland And then by the end of the year, well, they have rubber stamped, okay, these fellas are genuine Ireland contenders. And I think the full intention this year of just 
Neil in their colours to the mast early and railroading through. I said many times last year that I thought the thinness of their squad, which was thinner last year, the Vemmoth Bradley back in this year, they've added in a couple of new players there. Like I thought Barker was excellent uh, on on at, at the weekend. So they have added in two or three, but they went through with a, a, a thin, thin squad last year through the whole championship and they didn't pick up those injuries. And there's there's some sort of, there's plenty of misconceived wisdom out there that if you play too much, you get injured. Actually, there's research showing that if you play consistently and steadily, actually you build up a huge resilience. Now, it's a physical sport, so you can always pick up injuries, but playing regularly and training regularly does not mean that you'll get injured more. It actually means you'll get injured less going back the research and we see that in those super resilient players that are out there they're just there trucking week after week after week and they're phenomenal the players that miss a couple of weeks here and a couple of weeks here and take a month out for a rest here those are the players that tend to pick up then the wee niggles mm. but in terms of the mental fatigue Connor Glass playing the, the likes of the Glen boys playing I think they're they're raving on a wave at the minute. Even the, the wave of emotion caught up with him so much, he managed to get himself engaged over the weekend too. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the, so I think he could that that wave will carry him through the legs of the carry match, the legs of the throne match. But will it still be there? He's a phenomenal character, but will it still be there? Sort of in a month or two's time, you'd think at some stage there needs to be built in a wee natural sort of down period for him just to recharge the batteries. Even him as superhuman as he appears. Mm. Eamon can I ask you about that right as a manager when you're trying to integrate those kind of players back in and you know that they have had a very long spell like take the Cliffords for instance and Kerry similar situations how do you as a manager decide now is the time that they're ready to come back in and maybe they have to come back in for the points that end as making they want to play matches and that's going to help yeah no I, I was always a fan of giving players a break for the early part of the league um you, some of your big players are fellas that had uh, played a lot of football in the latter part of the year with their clubs, uh, Jackie. Um, oftentimes, our costs early in the league, we'd, <clears throat> we were often um, under pressure, you know, after maybe two or three games where we didn't have many points in the board, but we were happy enough that we'd plan that towards the latter half of the league, we would start to get our points. No, it's, it's probably changed because there used to be a, a fairly big gap for Kerry from the end of the league to the championship. And there was a, a space there where you could do a bit of work. Um, like with the Cliffords, I think they needed it, as as Enda said, more from a mental capacity than than anything else, just the constant getting up week in, week out. Uh, and again, if you're one of the, maybe the role players, it's one thing, but if you're one of the main players that the result is kind of almost riding on how you perform and how you lead, um, that can be wearing over a long period of time. So I think with the likes of the Connor Glasses and the and the Cliffords, they benefit from not having to be the person week in, week out through a whole season. And the Connor Glass one is interesting. End is right with the with the, the research there and the constantly keeping going from the physical point of view. But last year, you know, I felt he did tail off a bit towards the end of the championship. Um, he wasn't as good in the All-Ireland semi-final against Kerry as he can be. Um, and naturally, because like it, 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 to me, it's impossible to keep going at that level the whole way through. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them build in some kind of a break for him at some stage. I think this, this weekend was important to Derry as a group and as I mentioned, possibly to Mickey Hart personally. But Derry do have that feel of a very tight group as well. And they want to keep playing and they want to keep winning and they want to keep progressing and then feel that that was another step uh, this weekend. But the fact, Enda mentioned it there about Derry and Dublin having been the promoted teams last year, that's what makes Division 1 unbelievably interesting in terms of the bot bottom end of the division this year because generally the teams that get promoted, you'd be wondering, will they go straight back down again or what's going to happen? But all eight teams are so uh, even uh, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see who who goes down through the trap door. There was yeah. a year actually, Jackie. There was one year. I don't know. It was a two or three years ago, maybe a bit more. Maybe might have even been pre-COVID, where on the final day of the league, Kildare, the result that Kildare got, they could have either ended up in the league final or be relegated. 
and um, it was, it, and I wouldn't be surprised to see something similar happen in this year's league campaign, where a team could go into round seven, whereby they might end up, by virtue of winning the game, end up in the league final, and by losing it, could end up in Division Two. So it's, got, I think it will be that tight. That's why we love the league. Yeah. That's why we love the league. A um, couple of other performances to pick out then over the weekend. What about Mayo end up? Because again, last year they went out early doors, went for the league. Kevin McStay was very intent on saying, look, we really want to go after this thing. Based on the performance we saw at the weekend, it looks like they're taking a similar approach this year because no doubt about it, from the very get-go, they were up for this one. Yeah, they were up for horrible conditions. Uh, oh, we were talking oh earlier, how, 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 how much nicer is it to play in, in Croke Park? Well, A I'll lot easier to watch Croke it on the Park. telly too. I'll certainly take Croke Park over Salt Hill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Salt, no, Hill is so, Salt Hill is shocking in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so where am I at? I think nobody will uh, take really any notice. They're Mayo. They are capable of playing great football. They were well on it on a on Sunday. Did did we see anything particularly new from them? I'm I'm not sure. I was trying to convince myself last year. Their their running game has been brilliant for for a long long time, and their running game was in fine fettle like a lot of their big men, Owen McLaughlin, Fergal Boland, Jordan Flynn, Paddy, like all of them power runners that they have so well, and then playing that sort of what's come to be known as that wall ball where you're putting in the wee sort of pop pass into the full forward lane and taking off them again. All of that was running really, really nicely. Their their Achilles heel has been this sort of playing into the more sort of built defence or the more blanket defence. Galway were that much out of sorts. Uh, they were trying to do it at times, but Galway were not at the races really. So any sort of interpretation of Mayo's performance, uh, I think has to be taken with a huge asterisk of just Galway were in a difficult moment. Uh, Mayo done their job, we're looking well, will be a force to be reckoned with. Do they want to win it? I I think in Division 1, the prize is third place. I've seen it a few times that third third, third place is the winning spot in Division 1, really. You want to be out of the relegation battle, if at all possible. Not so much because Division 2, as Derry and Dublin have showed, Division 2 was previously considered as a, if you're in Division 2, you're not going to compete in the championship. Well, Derry and Dublin sort of put that to bed last year uh, and the level of division two is at this year means I, I think you could mount a credible campaign so it's not that relegation is is a major issue it's just relegation and the environment of that and the mentality of that creates in the camp it's a lot of work for management to try and turn the wheels and get things built up and build momentum it puts more pressure on your provincial campaign because if you get relegated you start, and then you're struggling the provincial campaign that's a double negative makes any sort of building of a campaign you're just going to hear all the negative voices all coming around outside it and ideally you don't want that uh, so teams don't want to get relegated for those sort of reasons more maybe than the cost of being in division two as it previously would have been uh, but being in the winning being in the league final and having that in the week prior or the two weeks prior to your provincial championship campaign, I don't think that's ideal, particularly for the likes of the Ulster teams when you're coming into the likes of the Ulster championship and, and Connacht to that degree too for Dublin and, and for Dublin for the Leinster teams, for uh, Munster teams. Uh, a league final place probably is fine because maybe the provincial championships aren't just at the level those other two are. Mm. You could argue from Mayo's point of view, Eamon, like even... They still managed to have a good championship run. It just, like after that Roscommon defeat, they still managed to kind of get back up on the horse. It's just a case of whether they felt the approach is right. What about the flip side for Galway then? Because they never got going last year. And maybe it was the Comer factory. Shane Walsh wasn't, you know, on it in the same way that he was. They don't have Peter Cook this year. It, it just seems like there was a compound of issues that they had last year that they maybe still need to sort out that the same problems exist this year. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Look, I think with Mayo last year, uh, like Mayo went down and beat Kerry and Killarney, the mm -hmm. first team in championship to win down there since the 90s. So at that stage, you know, I felt that they were they were chewing really all Ireland contenders, but it was just a bit of inconsistency. Then they played poorly at home against Laos. The Cork beat them. And after that, they ended up in the preliminary game, which took a good bit out of them. They had a good win against Galway, but they ran out of puff then the second half against Dublin, considering the schedule they'd had. So 
I, I don't think they're going to do that much differently from last year. They probably build a bit more gradually, but um, getting results like they did the last day, that was a huge result for them because three of their first four are away from home. They were they were away on Sunday. They are away to Kerry. They are away to Tyrone. And their home game is the Dubs next Saturday evening. So that's that's a really tough start. So that's that two points to them is worth more than just the two points, if that makes sense, considering mm-hmm. their schedule. But Galway will be disappointed. Padre Joyce will be disappointed, I think, particularly with their first half performance. They were playing with the Breeze. And I was mentioning about Salt Hill there. They're familiar with Salt Hill and they're familiar with those conditions. And I know Mayo's running and hard running game suits playing into the wind. But Galway just didn't look to be at it, body language wise, attitude wise. They they look to be stuck in gear a bit. Um, Jack Carney's performance was very impressive for me. Oh, I I Eddie Durkin, I think, got the official man of the match. Oh, Jack Carney I, was man of the match, Eamon. Yeah, I, I, felt so, anyway. I felt too as well. And yeah. it was something slightly different. I know it was similar enough to the way they play, but he looked to be playing almost like a seventh defender but he was then when they were coming with the ball he was an extra runner to drive on the attack and the fact that it was clever for Mayo I felt because he was on John Daly and Mayo knew what John Daly was going to do he was going to sit back in the pocket so by giving Jack Carney that license to roam deep and then come and attack uh, with numbers I thought it was an interesting one but Galway will be just Disappointed, but I don't think they'll panic either, Jackie. Like uh, Damien Comer, Liam Silk were missing yesterday. Paul Conroy only came on as a sub, but most sig- significantly, and I saw this morning that he's probably out for a good bit of the league, was Killian McTade. Yeah. He's an absolute massive, massive player for them. And, you know, the year that they they won the All-Ar- or they got to the All Ireland final when Kerry beat them in the final, he was absolutely pivotal to that drive. And, uh, and even the day of the final, he was outstanding. So, Getting him back and getting him back fit and uh, able to play the games injury free, I would imagine, would be a huge priority for Galway. Mm. Yeah, like it. I guess Rory, it, it's like Eamon says, the one performance on the very first day isn't going to make anybody panic. But I guess it does make you think, and you don't have an awful lot of time. And if you are poor at Joyce and you're thinking, how do I plan without somebody like McDade, without Cook? It, it is trying to factor in where where is next group of leaders coming from because mm. I, I didn't see them on the weekend. And they need Sean Kelly. I mean, Sean Kelly's such a massive yeah. player for them as well. Like, I, the only thing is, and Eamon is spot on, you shouldn't be any major panic. I mean, if you think back to this time last year, Donegal beat Kerry and everybody was saying, whoa, and sure, look what happened to Donegal after that, you know? <laughs> so I do think you kind of have to sort of, you know, Rain in the horses a small bit. Conor McKeown is a fantastic piece to today in the Irish Independent. Actually, about you know not falling suspect to the uh, to the league's wily charms. There's a couple of great lines in it. It's well worth the read for anybody that has access to it. But I think that there won't be any panic. I think Park Joyce is a pretty cool individual. That you know they'll have. The thing for Galway is to target. We mentioned this last week. Target three or four key games. Now, you're, obviously, your home games is what you would prefer to win. Target your three or four uh, games. Try and flesh out your panel as much as you can. Sort out your injuries ahead of championship. They know where they're going to be come the summertime. All the teams in Division 1 are competing for Sam Maguire, irregardless of what happens. And that's where your focus needs to shift to. Were Galway ever looking to try and win this league from the from the get-go? I don't think so. So I don't necessarily see any reason for them to be pushing any panic buttons just yet. Their performance yesterday was flat. That will disappoint them. Eamon mentioned, I think, before we started recording, it was the manner, I suppose, more so than the actual defeat itself. That will probably rankle a small bit. Mm, Yep, understandable. Look, it's very early days. So let's leave Galway aside for now. What about Tyrone then, Enda? Because... Firstly, the performance of Derek Canavan, as much as his father on the telly tries to play it down every week, which is just hilarious to watch. I mean, he is just becoming the star that everybody knew he was going to be. And if Tyrone are going to deliver something, he's so central, isn't he? He is central. I'm not going to just take after his father here, but there is a a supporting cast. And I suppose for, for Tyrone, Dara's there. That's 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 great, and you'd absolutely take him every day of the week. But there needed to be sort of a freshen up and a newness. Now, Monon and Throne were the two favourites strongly to be relegated. I think prior to throw in on at, at the weekend. So the fact that both teams won well, 
uh, Trum fledging a lot of new players, uh, but they they done well. There was an energy about the Trum performance and and a pace at times, particularly which was most pleasing in response to the sentence off. Now the sentence off for me was was a, a soft one. I think I think he'll he'll end up getting it, it cleared. I would imagine. Uh, if that happened, and uh, and uh, if that happened in hurling, the Ross Common lad would have got booked. The Ross Common lad would have got booked for David. <laughs> Absolutely, but uh, Throne, Throne's response to that was was very very emphatic, and it was it was Dara stood up, got a couple of big scores at that time, and suddenly then the, you you had the momentum to to push on home, and the confidence started to come into the squad, and, and you could see them all playing that wee bit better now. Again, there's an asterisk there too. Not only like the the Mayo win, a uh, goal we were missing a lot of players. Ross Common are missing a lot of players too. Even outside of of the St Bridget's contingent, they're they're missing the likes of Alton Harney and Enda Smith. You know, so they'll they'll be a lot stronger as well later on in the in the league. Uh, but Throne again, you have to face what you're facing. Throne have been up and down, have got off to rocky enough starts over the past few years, none none less than than last year, obviously. So the fact that it was such a newish look team, uh, the fact that they blended well with their key men, so the, the, like the likes of Padraig Hamshi, I thought was was brilliant, Michael McCarron. And so th- those players are playing well. Petey Hart, the centre half forward, started off really, really prominent. So the, that that older brigade look as if they're 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 in a good place. You'll have Matty Donnelly coming back in, hopefully towards towards the end of things. Uh, but it's it's that new sort of five six. Throne players that Throne have been needing. Uh, there looked to be a good bunch of them showing well uh, at the weekend, which which bodes well, but they are going to get the acid test next week. Mm, yeah. Hey, Jack, and- Jackie, Jackie, just mm-hmm. on just just one point though, I'd like to make on Derek Canavan. Like I think sometimes it can get forgotten <clears throat> um how difficult it can be sometimes for a young player when he's the son of such a legendary figure. And the pressure that that sometimes brings, I am um, in a previous guys I worked with uh, the son of a Cork legendary player. Now this particular son was an average, not an average. He was a very very good club player, but I saw it with my own. I saw it from first hand experience how difficult he found it at times, knowing that the brick bats were coming. Oh, he's not as good as the old fella and all this type of stuff. And that's and the type of pressures that that brought to him every time he went out to play, and I think sometimes that does tend to get forgotten. I un- I can understand why Peter might want to play him because Peter would obviously want Dara to just carve out his own niche and his own story and his own journey in Gaelic football. But he's an he's an incredible talent. He is an absolutely incredible mm-hmm. talent. He is right up there for me. Like he like in terms of like so young the leadership already that he's bringing I think his best days are still to come his finishing ability his bravery skills everything uh, I just think one of the real special talents and right up there with the Cliffords and the Conor Callaghan's for me yeah I agree what what I like out of the the likes of Dara's I know to use the word journey is a bit of a cliche now but Thinking, I was looking at Stephen O'Hanlon. Stephen O'Hanlon burst on the scene for Monaghan a couple of years ago with that goal. I think it was again Dublin. I think I've seen it on Twitter. Obviously, it was doing the rounds again. Uh, but he burst on the scene, prodigiously talented footballer. And yet, it takes years for the vast majority of players. It takes years of getting your moments here and there, getting your start times, and then getting your subs, and then maybe getting a good run of games, but then maybe having a wee loser form or picking up an injury. It takes you have to be such a resilient character now. And I think it's a brilliant lesson for all the youngsters not there that are that are hopeful of ever making it in the game. It's it's not easy. It's not flash in the pan. You don't suddenly just arrive as a as a finished article. There is years of ups and downs that you have to weather and you have to sustain. And the, for the players that do that, I think you just admire them all, all the more. So like Stephen O'Hanlon and how well he spoke a thought after the game. The, his performance, everything about it. And yet there is a player ups and downs over the past several years and he's there. Dara came on with huge pressure on his shoulders. And again, first couple of years was tough enough, but you can see him coming in. He's still he's still young, but so often right around the counties, you see players that take their time to come in, can show their moments of brilliance, but it takes a long time to then be able to go from there. For the, most players, there is the absolute 
uh, exceptions to the rule. Mr. Clifford stepped forward, but for the vast, vast majority of normal, not even normal, brilliant county players, it takes a long time of persistence to get to that level. Yeah, and let's not forget to have 14 other handy players around you. It might help as well if you do want to win something. Let's move on to Division 2 before we run out of time on this one because lots of headlines coming out of the division. Do we have to? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, Rory, to uh, burst the bubble on a brilliant Division 1 football. But Division 2 was actually pretty entertaining as well. If you think about Donegal, I know from a Cork point of view, not an easy watch, but watching a team scoring 120 is pretty good going. Tavern, great win against Kildare, who looked like they're going to find life away from Newbridge a little difficult. Lowe's, a little bit unlucky maybe against Armagh, you might say. One point win for Kieran McGuinney's side and Meath and Fermanagh with a draw. They're the headlines, but... I think, Eamon, you have to start with Donegal. Jimmy's winning matches again, as if it was ever in doubt. But I have to say, the style of football to me was probably as um, promising as we've seen from Donegal in quite a while. I had I haven't seen them playing that kind of attacking football in, in a few years. Yeah, no, it was. It was refreshing. And uh, I think even in the McKenna Cup games, you could see that they were seriously fist number one. And then as well, that they were way more physical than they have been the last couple of years. It was like... They were playing an non-contact sport for a lot of the time. The last couple of seasons when they were in possession, they were going sideways, backwards, avoiding contact. And the the physical element was gone out of them without the ball as well, which was a central part of their their identity when, when McGuinness was with them first time around. So um, great to see it. I mean, they, they were playing with the, the, the wind in the first half. They really pinned in Cork. They went after the kickouts. They were very aggressive and pushing up, tackling, um, the way that I feel the game should go if you want to be uh, progressive and really go after teams rather than allowing them have these periods of possession where you just sit off them, just go after them, push up the field and put them under pressure because the players aren't used to dealing with that at the moment. And even the Derry lads who are very comfortable in the ball, you could see see when Kerry pushed up in them for that period when they did the, the man advantage or the black card, they really put them under pressure and Cork struggled with it at times and I thought it was fascinating the second half then that when Cork were with the wind, Donegal still continued to press the kickouts and still forced them long even though the Cork were able to go over the press and it just shows the intent uh, that they have and uh, afterwards when when Jim McGuinness was talking to the press, one of the things that I thought was interesting he said is that they he wants to get rid of the the kind of sideways, backwards football that he wants to go forward. And you could see that, whether it was, I saw Ryan McHugh a couple of times in possession. He kicked from the full back line out, kicked 30, 40 yard passes, and it got them on the front, pa- front, front foot straight away. Whereas last year they weren't, they were, that pass was going backwards and it was, it was holding them up. And McBrearty's goal as well, you know, was a, a kind of a, a sign of intent, he had support, but he 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 went for it himself. He probably took a good few steps, all right, but you could see the intent and the attack, the the attacking mind was there to go for the goal, and he wasn't just chipping it over the bar. So it was a hugely impressive performance from Donegal, and it's there. We're all going to be, I think, tuned into them for the next couple of weeks and possibly for the season because they're going to be they're going to be a fascinating watch watch for sure. Yeah, unless you're from Cork, Rory. Yeah, it was a desperate day at the office for Cork and they but I think look, the yeah, I Paddy Kelly making the point in the examiner there this morning that they just defended that little bit too deep. The goal were able to kick scores using a gale force wind, which died down at halftime. If there was ever a lesson about winning the toss and playing with the wind in the first half. But uh yeah, like it was just a bad day. I don't think they'll be panicking too much. It does set them up uh, a very, very difficult task next week. Um, I watched Loud uh, our man full Loud in RD next 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 Sunday is not going to be easy, and um, you know they were one of the teams that many people might have picked for relegation out of Division Two, and you know they might end up becoming a bit of a surprise team in the end. So they've got to dust themselves down and get and get back on the horse fairly quickly. But I think, look, all the credit really to Donegal. It was, I think, Eamon mentioned how physically engaged they were. I think their conditioning, you could see straight away, which I think Jim McGuinness teams have always put a huge emphasis on. They look like they're in pretty good shape already. And I'd imagine by the time they get the championship, that Donegal Derry match in the Ulster Championship will be one hell of an encounter. It'll be county boards up 
and down the country really really hoping that Jim McGuinness has done a goal it doesn't work out for because otherwise then all the county teams will be looking pretty Christmas holidays next year yeah. <laughs> it's working well for them though in fairness you look oh, at it is. the they're, they're moving they're really in. yeah and it's it's it is fascinating because we obviously associate McGuinness with the blanket defence and then the, the side to side football that has come in but McGuinness has done a goal never really played the, the side to side football the side to side football was brought in to sort of counter the blanket defence, which was feeding off the turnovers that the old tradition, playing traditionally into a blanket defence, coughed up the turnovers, which Donegal, remember there, that team on them again, they bombed forward at massive pace. So they were a very, very direct team. They just ran all backwards whenever, whenever they had to defend. And then to counter that, teams brought in the lateral passing to not give up the turnovers to allow them to counterattack. Mm -hmm. But the game, it really felt... Like, and I've been hoping that the game would evolve for years and years and been arguing, we don't need to change the rules, the game will evolve. And I'd actually lost hope last year, the year before, that, no, I think rule changes are needed. And there's there, there's a big now query, well, are we definitely going to need rule changes? The blanket defence is still there, still will have, we still will have moments, significant patches of games and potentially full games where it's a lot of the lateral passing, which is tough to watch. But definitely there seemed to be a real momentum over the weekend to go after teams, the high press, not just on kickouts, but to push up harder in more general play. The value of pace and really trying to break down teams. I think teams have got themselves, players have got themselves into such phenomenal condition. The skill level, the decision making, all of it is so high that I now think teams are backing themselves to go out and break down a blanket defence. And if they do turn over to have the legs and the condition to be able to cope and get some sort of a scramble defence that you're not... Uh, getting hurt badly at the other end so for me you can't read anything into week one of the National League in terms of form lines and who's going to end up where when the dust all settles later on in the year but the biggest thing for me was there just seems to be a definite moment in the evolution of the game that we've been waiting on maybe that moment has come we'll see over the coming weeks but week one of the National League is usually a wee bit cagey like teams are still only getting up but there was a confidence about a lot of the teams play that was brilliant to see. Uh, and like even the crowds at the games, everyone, I thought everything, it was such a positive first weekend uh, for me. Yes, results and for Corkman, and uh, there's always results goes a bit AWOL. But uh, in general, a lot of teams, there, there's a clear sense of direction coming out of the game. There's yeah. 10 and a half, 10 and a half thousand in the athletic grounds for Armagh Lowe's, Jackie. It's phenomenal, 10, isn't it? 10 and a half thousand is incredible. Yeah. It is encouraging though, because I think on what you're saying, and uh, People are starting to come back to football because they're they're being encouraged to do so. You know, if you're in Armagh and you watch the Dr. McKenna Cup, which obviously has always been a brilliant uh, tournament, the style of football has changed. And and you're right to say that. And Eamon, it was you were saying this at the very start of this podcast as well. It was encouraging to see people playing attacking football. And yeah, look, we're all right. Let's not get carried away on one week of football. But I think as a starting point for the year ahead, I think we should all be fairly encouraged by what we've seen this weekend. Uh, definitely, Jay. And look, the thing about it is that oftentimes what you can pick up from the early season games is, you know, farm results, all of that's fair enough. But you can see what teams have worked on in the close season. You can see the things that they've identified that will take the group forward for the coming season. And, you know, that, that, that front foot football, that more direct, the willingness to kick in the final third, the uh, um, tackling uh, teams much higher up the pitch going after kickouts. There was definitely like, a pattern like, of that this week. Fly goalkeepers, Eamon. Fly goalkeepers yeah. getting caught off their line. How many times yeah. have, how many times are we going to see that? And at what stage? Loads, loads, at what of, times, no clear, <laughs> loads of times. No clear already. Loads of times. Like Oren Lynch caught again. Um, I think it, it, it happened in the Cork Donegal match. Risk versus yeah. reward. What's your view on that? I mean, do you well, do you? Um, no, I think Oren Lynch is essential to, uh, to to the way Derry play. Like, he, he was central to that winning point. You know, he got the kick out away short. He supported the play. He came up with his dead ease. He created the extra man. And Derry are brilliant at, let's say, eye marking Enda. Enda's playing with Derry. Oren Lynch is coming. If I move off Enda to go towards Oren Lynch at all, Enda becomes an option straight away, absolutely cuts towards goal, and Oren Lynch hits him with the pass. So they're absolutely, they've clearly worked on it again and again and again. Yeah. Um, that that time he got caught for the goal, like 
he he could have possibly anticipated that maybe a turnover was going to happen because he kind of continued his run and it wasn't like he was protecting his goals. But I think far more comes off him than it, than it's conceded by him. To be honest, uh, Rory. So it's, I, I don't think we'll see it changing anytime soon. I think I think it's going to become an even more important counter move to to the high press because the keepers were coming out even when teams were dropping off to sort of give an overlap maybe a, between midfield and the 45 to create a wee opening there but if a team is pressed up and gambling to come up the pitch and go after you then getting that plus one coming out through defense means you're then you've got out through the high press which means you're then attacking into a more open defense uh, so the value of having that keeper it'll be critical because Teams will want to be able to defeat the high press. They don't want to cough up turnovers. Uh, so your keeper being a plus one back there can only be countered completely if the opposition put up another player, which is really kamikaze stuff. So I think the keeper being comfortable on the ball and being able to support his defenders when an opposition is trying to execute a high press is going to be critical. And the key I'd go, the I'd game go with kamikaze being... and uh, I go kamikaze. <laughs> and come here, we can't. Especially if the gang are playing against the wind. If yeah. you're playing with the wind and they're not going to get a kick away, I'd I'd go after the goalie as well. I'd mark him as well. And come here, you can't all be shouting for let's play attacking football and then say, oh, but no, let's put everybody back behind the ball. You know, you can't have it every which way either, no. lads. You know, no. so. Right, come here. That's a debate we're going to have to come back to another day because we are right out of time. There's just too much football to talk about, which is the good news. So, uh, Enda, Eamon, thanks a million for being with us. And we'll be back at, later in the week with another RTEGA podcast. We'll talk to you then. Oh, there's the whistle. It's over. It's over.